so uh, let's get started. Uh, one last, uh, a couple more uh, lectures uh, on concurrency control. Uh, but before I get to that, uh, I'd like to do a couple of uh, quick recaps. Uh, first of these, uh, for a schema RAB SBC, um, let's say we have two queries uh, with R natural join S. And what happens if we um, do a selection on A, uh, then a projection on A, uh, sorry, projection on A and C, then a selection on A? Uh, is it legitimate to flip those two? No. No? Yes? Maybe? Sometimes? Yes. OK. Um, so we have we, we defined this notion of, of equivalence a while ago. Um, now, I haven't mentioned it in quite a while because it hasn't really been necessary, but uh, I hope you guys remember the renaming operator, uh, row. And remember the semantics of this are essentially that you can take uh, any query and sort of rename the, uh, the uh, attributes in the schema of that query. So for example, uh, we have two queries here. One we're projecting, where we're projecting down to A and C, and one we're, uh, one where we're just projecting down to A and C, and one where we're uh, then renaming those two uh, to X and Y. Are these two equivalent queries? So strictly speaking, they're not equivalent, but you're right. They are essentially computing the same thing. They're just calling it slightly different. Now, um, I'd like to uh, point out something, uh, namely that equivalent queries, uh, it's very easy to identify when two queries are equivalent. You can, uh, we've already talked about a whole slew of tests where you can, that you can run on two queries, uh, transformations to determine whether or not two queries are equivalent. Now, whether or not it surprises you, uh, th this may or may not surprise you, but this, this sort of equivalence test is not limited to query language. Limited to pretty much uh, the, the sort of equivalence testing can be performed on nearly any sort of programming languages. So basically, what I want you to take away from this is please do not submit anyone else's code as your own because I will find out and you will get punished. Okay. That said, a couple of reminders. Uh, there will be a homework posted tonight. Uh, it will be due the Wednesday after the break. Um, the midterm exam has been graded. Um, I will post that as soon as it is possible to get them all into uh, computerized form. So that will be soon. Uh, and yeah. Um, okay. So getting into actual content now. Um, a couple of uh, bits of recap. So last uh, last. Last week, we talked about uh, this idea of intent blocks, um, where you have this hierarchy of, um, uh, where you have these hierarchies of uh, objects, namely the database, the, the table, the page, the tuples. Um, and you can lock lower, uh, lock, lock sort of smaller granularity objects by taking an intent lock out on all of the higher granularity objects. And this allows, uh, by sort of keeping track, carefully keeping track of um, what locks are compatible, uh, which intent locks are compatible with which um, operation locks, we can, we can do a reasonable job of uh, making sure that no two objects uh, can be uh, sorry, no two transactions uh, try and grab uh, locks on conflicting uh, portions of, of the database. So, uh, are there any questions on, on sort of the, the lock modes that we talked about on Friday? Okay. Um, so, uh, the last thing we ended up talking about on Friday was this idea that locking uh, essentially uh, assumes that we have the ability to lock all of the objects in a particular class of objects. Um, and if we're inserting objects, if we're modifying uh, those objects, then there's a chance that we'll end up with an inconsistent state, even if we do actually lock 
all the oh, really? yeah. 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 Great. Uh, so even if uh, we have we try and modify um, unless we try and uh, sort of lock uh, a superset of the objects, um, we will not be able to properly um, we may end up with a situation where uh, two transactions are still allowed to progress. Um, and the example I gave was a situation where we have transaction one uh, that's inserting, uh, sorry, that's deleting the officer with rank one of maximal age. Uh, then transaction two comes along uh, and inserts a new officer uh, which, who has rank one at a higher age. Um, transaction two then comes along and deletes the officer of rank two with highest age. And then finally, transaction uh, one comes along and selects the officer with rank two uh, with the highest age. And this is, this is essentially an inconsistent schedule uh, because uh, transaction, this operation depends on this operation, and this operation depends on this operation, and we have this uh, failure to order the operations properly even though transaction one might still have locked all of the objects in, uh, in the officer's table. Now there are two general solutions to this. We can either, oh, sorry, three general solutions to this. Uh, we can lock the entire table, um, but that is potentially quite expensive since it means no other operation uh, can come in and access or modify that table at the same time. Uh, even if you're only modifying some subset of the rows. So, for, so what is potentially more efficient is uh, when we can lock uh, predicates. So we can provide a condition that says the only tuples I will be modifying or accessing have some uh, predicate on them. Uh, for example, rank equals one. Uh, what we can do is tell the database, I would like to lock this predicate. And if another transaction comes along, um, it's going to need to check to see if any other uh, transaction has locked a predicate that conflicts with it. Now that's sort of a vague and fuzzy notion. I'll, I'll make that a little more clear in a couple of, uh, in a couple of slides. Uh, but something that is typically, uh, the way this is typically implemented is by locking index pages. Uh, so recall that indices uh, essentially allow us to evaluate certain predicates more efficiently. They group tuples that satisfy a particular problem uh, into one place. Um, so by locking the pages of the index, uh, we actually have a way of very efficiently uh, locking predicates. And I'll also get into that uh, in a moment. Uh, but does anyone have uh, any questions about sort of the high level concept here? Okay. Um, Of uh, locking the index pages, yeah. uh, the previous transaction which is uh, acquiring the lock will work fine. I, I just have a query when you try to insert a new tuple into a relation, uh, how will the index page accommodate it? Because uh, when you insert a new tuple into a relation, its index has to be inserted into the index table as well. Yeah. So will it not lead to conflict? Because if the index relation is already Insert has been logged by another transaction. So if you uh, if two transactions are trying to modify, uh, so let's say two transactions are trying to uh, modify uh, officers with rank equals one. Mm -hmm. We don't want those transactions running at the same time. So uh, yes, there will be a conflict, but that's that's a good thing. Or that that is the the desire. We, the, the conflict will be detected. That's that's the point. Uh, any any other questions? Okay. Um, all right. So the most general of these is this idea of locking indices. Uh, sorry. Uh, the let me start off with with uh, by describing indices uh, and index locking. So if we have uh, an index, let's say on rank. Um, and T1 wants to modify officers uh, that have a rank of 1, 
then T1 just needs to find the page or, or potentially pages that store officers with rank equal one, and then it just needs to lock those. Um, of course, if no such entries exist, then we'll, need, we'll still need to uh, lock the page where an entry would potentially go. Um, now, there's a little bit of a challenge here because we need to keep, um, we need to, we may have multiple indices on the same object. Uh, so when we're modifying a particular uh, object, we need to make sure that no other transaction can modify that same object. Um, if we're modifying a particular object, we need to make sure that no other uh, read operations uh, will um, conflict with that as well. So we can do that by keeping track of, of sort of, we, we can keep sort of a primary index at any given time um, and allow us, and that would essentially allow us to um, to detect when, a, when an index is, uh, if we ensure that all of the locks get applied to that particular primary index, then that allows us to detect very efficiently when um, uh, two conflicts occur. Uh, the other possibility is to actually do some sort of something a little more crazy uh, along the lines of uh, predicate locking. Uh, now the idea here is to grant a lock on all of the records that satisfy some sort of logical predicate. Now you can do this in two, two ways. The first is to actually iterate over the entire database, scan the, the perform that particular query, find every single tuple that satisfies this particular predicate, and then grant a lock on that tuple. And that's potentially going to be quite inefficient, um, and especially if you're trying to do uh, a query on that the, the, that set of values, uh, you, well, uh, you're basically paying the overhead of running the query twice, once to acquire the locks and once to actually uh, do the, the computation that you're interested in. Um, so what we need is some way of uh, computing the intersection between two predicates. Now, typically this is not feasible. Um, in the worst case, there will not be an analytical solution to uh, the in, uh, computing the intersection of, of two predicates, but you can often use uh, sort of a conservative approximation. If there is the possibility that two uh, predicates could conflict, um, you can sort of say they, they will conflict and um, those two blocks can't be taken at the same time. Now, um, you can think of index locking as a special case of this, uh, specifically when an index uh, exists for that particular predicate. Um, and this allows us to very easily identify potentially a superset uh, of the records that satisfy the, pre uh, the predicates that we're interested in. Um, we don't, because we don't have to do this uh, sort of conflict detection, uh, we also get much better sealing properties since uh, we don't have to check every single other transaction that's currently running in the system to detect whether it has a lock and a conflicting predicate. And as a consequence of that, uh, we very rarely use uh, predicate locking in practical systems. Uh, more often than not, uh, this sort of process gets done by index locking. So, uh, any questions up to this point? All right. Um, onwards. Um, so now the big challenge here is to actually do the locking. How do we actually lock all of the leaf pages that we're interested in? Now the, the problem, or the, the main difficulty of, of doing locking on um, tree indices so uh, first off, uh, before I get into this, does everyone sort of get uh, how how a hash index would work? Uh, how how you you would do blocking on a hash index? There usually just the directory page or pages, and there's the data page or pages for each bin. Um, so you can think of this as a sort of a uh, very very short tree structure. Um, anything that we talk about here is essentially going to be applicable. 
Now, the big challenge of, of locking tree indices is that the tree nodes can potentially change. Um, if we're talking about an ISAM index, the trees, uh, tree nodes can't change. Um, but most of the other problems still apply. Um, so the tree, indices, the, the tree nodes can change. And trying to find all of the, uh, trying to get locks on. Sorry. Uh, so, with respect, um, so um, the, the challenge here is essentially that the, the tree nodes can change. And because of that, uh, we need to have some way of not locking not just the leaf nodes, but also the, the intermediate nodes in the tree. Um, and you, you might think that this is, uh, this is actually quite similar to this idea of multiple granularity locking that we were talking about. Um, but it's a little bit more difficult because in this case, you don't just want to modify uh, the, grabbing a, a, a lock on a, a, a coarse uh, grain object doesn't just mean that you're interested in uh, modifying that object, it means you're interested in modifying Child of the parent, 
Um, and so you have to modify that. So you have to modify that pointer, delete that pointer, but the root is still untouched. And really the chance that uh, a node is going to get modified decreases the higher up in the, the tree it is. Now to make this a little more concrete, uh, well, um, we only need to have, when we're modifying a tree, uh, a tree index, we only have to have a lock on um, the subset of the tree pages that could potentially be modified. Now what are the, the conditions for a, um, for a tree node to be modified in a B plus tree? So when, when does a, a B plus tree node go away or get merged with one of its peers? Yes, so when the occupancy of the page uh, drops below half, then um, the page will go away. So if the child is less than half full, then uh, we can, we know that the, uh, if we're doing a deletion and the child is, is uh, less than half full, then we know that this, this node could be modified. Uh, what's the condition for uh, splitting a node? Uh, when we do an insertion? When the node is full. So if we try and do an insertion into a node and it's already full, we need to split. So we can uh, exploit these observations uh, to come up with a, pro a protocol for locking these trees uh, that doesn't have this annoying uh, property um, that the root node is always locked. But, um, sorry, uh, no, but, but uh, so this, this protocol is going to be correct, and I, I claim that it will be correct and it will preserve serializability, uh, even though it violates the two-phase locking uh, constraints that we've been using to ensure serializability up to this point. So the, the simplest form of this algorithm is that we start at the root node, and if we're doing just a scan, if we're just reading, we're going to lock uh, the parent node with an S, and then we're going to uh, descend to its child and uh, lock that with an S, and as soon as the child is, is safely locked with an S, um, the parent is also is the parent lock will be released. Uh, conversely, so when we're doing an update, that is to say an insertion or a deletion, uh, we're going to do something fairly similar. So we're going to start at the root. We're going to acquire uh, an X lock on the root. Then we're going to descend. Acquire an X lock. Yes. Do you have a question? Uh, acquire an X lock on the child. And if the child is safe, I'll define safe in a moment. But if the child is safe, then we can release the lock on the parent. And what I mean by a safe child is um, essentially what we just talked about. Um, if the node is full, then it's not safe for inserts. Uh, and if the node is half is near uh, one step away from being half empty, then it's not safe for deletes. Um, one sort of additional caveat is that a node is safe if all of its children are safe. So even if uh, so, you, you just need sort of one buffer space. Um, so just answered this. So let me give you a, a more concrete example of this. So I have here a B plus tree, uh, contains a bunch of data, uh, and we're going to start off by doing a read of uh, the value 38. So in order to do, to do that, we're going to acquire a shared block on the root, um, acquire a shared block on its child, uh, and just descend each time we uh, acquire a new block, we can release the parent. Now once we have a shared block on the data page, um, we're, we're safe. And we can do our read. Yes? Uh, let me check if the node is safe or not. We need to know all the child, all the children are safe or not, right? Um, so it is, there, there are two, uh, two conditions. 
So if we're doing in, an insertion, it's safe if it's uh, if it's not full. But then uh, hold hold that thought for uh, this uh, this example. Um, the example after this uh, should hopefully clarify the point. Or insert of twenty five should should hopefully clarify that. So uh, yeah. Um, so you can actually do this as you're acquiring the locks. So if you acquire a lock and uh, release its parent, basically as, as soon as you release a lock, you can release, you, you can iterate back, back along your recursive path um, and find all of the parent nodes uh, that are still locked. And if they're still locked, then you can sort of recheck to see if they have any children that are locked. Basically, as soon as a parent has no children that are locked, it's essentially safe because somewhere down the line. Uh, but hold that thought for example until example four, and that should hopefully uh, clarify the point a little bit. Uh, so if we're going to delete uh, thirty-eight, we do the same thing. Uh, acquire a lock. Actually, this one should should cover. Um, so we acquire a lock on thirty-five. No, sorry, on the the second tier. Uh, um, and now we can. Uh, so we acquire a lock on the root, and you'll note that the root is half full, so it's not safe. You acquire a lock on the second tier node, and once again, it's half full, so it's not safe. Um, but now you acquire a lock on this node, so you can go basically back up the tree and free all of uh, the ancestors because that node is safe. Um, once again, go down, that node is safe, so you can release it. Um, oh, sorry, you need to keep a lock on the last tier because it gets modified. Um, and then you update the leaf node, you update the uh, node that's pointing to it, and all of a sudden, you're done. Uh, you're gonna insert 45, very similar process, um, now you can immediately release the, uh, the lock on the root because this is safe for insertions. Uh, however, this is not safe for uh, this is not safe for insertions because it's full. Um, so you acquire a lock on the root. Now that you've determined that this node is empty, it won't cause a split, and the insertion isn't going to affect the key there. Uh, you can release all of the parent blocks, same deal as before, uh, modify the root node, and we're done. And now if you do actually need to split, in this case we acquire a lock on uh, the leaf node, the leaf node is full, so we hold on to the, the lock for its parent, and we do an insertion um, modifying the, the node there as needed. Um, any questions on this? Um, so if if there's a shared lock on this, 
uh, if there is already a shared lock on this, then we can't get an exclusive lock on it. And if we're doing a scan, we need to get a shared lock on the entire range. Any other questions?
And recall, intents to exclude locks are compatible. Uh, what they're not compatible with is uh, other exclusion locks. <coughs> so what we can do is keep grabbing intent to exclude locks and hold on to them. So we keep, uh, we keep those intent to exclude locks um, all the way down through the tree. And we only modify the, um, the only exclusive lock that we actually take uh, is on the leaf node. It's actually quite similar to this uh, multiple granularity locking process that we've been talking about uh, previously. Um, if it turns out that all we need is the exclusive lock, then we can just go back up the tree and release all of the intent to exclude locks. Otherwise, we convert those locks uh, to full exclude locks uh, as needed. Well,